Hey YouTubers, this is Lonnie Clark, Nuts for Art. I'm going to read a little bit more from Population Control Through Nuclear Pollution by Arthur Tamplin and John Goffman. We're on uh, Chapter 5, which is Lip Service to the Public Health. And we're on page 88, a uh, new subtitle called Plowshare Plans for Bigger and Bigger Explosions. Plowshare, the quote, peaceful, unquote, nuclear explosives program worried us more than anything else except for nuclear weapons. At that moment, we hadn't thought much about nuclear reactors. From rare experimental detonations with small nuclear explosives, the men of this program were wetting their appetites for bigger and more nuclear explosives. Commercially, they were cheap, the plowshare, <clears throat> I'm sorry, they were cheap, the plowshare advocates advertised, why, we can have thousands of such detonations annually and just around the corner. Worse yet, the chief advocate for Plowshare, Professor Edward Teller, the devil, called Goffman in for a talk during this period. He explained that he explained his view that at the worst, radioactivity and radiation dosage to people wouldn't kill as many people as many human beings as many other environmental hazards and many things we accept without thought or concern, like 50,000 people killed per year in automobile accidents. Goffman told Dr. Teller he didn't know how bad the radiation hazard might be, that as Dr. Teller knew, we were in the midst of serious investigations of precisely that problem, and in spite of his assurances, we were indeed very concerned. Dr. Teller did not consider the effect of small amounts of radiation to be, to be of consequence to human beings and said he thought we shouldn't be worried about it. Plowshare, he said, could do many wonderful things for man with nuclear explosives, and what Plowshare needed was permission to give the public three times as much radiation as currently allowable under the federal radiation guidelines. Well, President Obama did that for you, Dr. Teller, only thousands of times more. Dr. Teller told Goffman that with his national standing and prestige, he, Goffman, could be of enormous help in prevailing upon authorities to raise the permissible dose limits, and that this would allow a full blooming of the, quote, peaceful, unquote, nuclear explosives program. Goffman simply told Dr. Teller he couldn't conceivably be of help in that manner. We were very concerned, and even, <clears throat> we were very concerned even the present guideline radiation might mean extremely grave risk for the human species. And with that concern, suggesting three times more was unthinkable. <clears throat> Lest anyone understand, we were certainly prepared to believe Dr. Teller was totally concerned, was totally sincere in his unconcern over the radiation hazard. The real problem is that technology bends people into such unconcern and leads them with utmost sincerity to disastrous positions on matters of pollution of the environment. New subtitle. It was a time for worry. At this point, we were more accurately, I'm sorry, at this point, we were more acutely worried than ever. The radiation effects problems must be immediately dominant. Here we had pressure from nuclear projects to raise the radiation dose allowed to people three times more. This means 60 times as high as the dosages Linus Pauling and the other 11,201 scientists who signed his petition considered as representing a great problem. Wow, I didn't know that. 11,200 and other scientists considered that the current one in 1970. Wow, back to reading. Why weren't we worried about the prospect of 20 or 60 times as much radiation to the public? An amount likely on the early horizon with a determined and wrapping pushing of AEC programs. Had Pauling ever been proved wrong? Had anyone shown that Pauling's dire predictions were overstated? We know we knew of no disproof of Pauling's work, nor of his estimates of radiation hazard. 
It can and should be asked, since we couldn't believe in or defend the allowable dosage of radiation by federal standards, why we didn't attack those radiation standards as being dangerous to human life. Why didn't we sound an alarm about burgeoning plowshare activities that had hopes of permitting even a threefold higher dose than existing standards? That's a great question. Our answer is that we were mesmerized by what represents a fantastic error of thinking that has characterized atomic energy development and just about every other technology capable of, of releasing byproduct poisons upon the public. And, under, and understanding the basis for such mesmerization is the most critical single issue facing everyone concerned about reversing the catastrophic downward plunge of the environmental crisis. Let me read that again. Our answer is that we were mesmerized by what pre represents a fantastic error of thinking that has characterized atomic energy development and just about every other public tech and every other technology capable of releasing byproduct poisons upon the public. And understanding the basis for such mesmerization is the most critical single issue facing everyone concerned about reversing the catastrophic downward plunge of the environmental crisis. And it is no accident that such foolish mesmerization is widespread, even in those primarily charged with concerning themselves with hazards to the public, like us. New subtitle. It's dangerous to go ahead if safety is not assured. This error is that if one can't prove a particular dose of technological poison, radioactivity in this case, is unsafe, the technology, atomic energy in this case, is allowed to proceed full tilt, even though the harm it may be doing to human life and toward irreversible poisoning of the planet are both extreme. How does one get into a position of subscribing to such a dangerous Rasputin-like mesmerizing spell? We did for all too long a time. What can we say? What we can say is that we, at least, have by now broken completely the bonds of this nonsensical spell, while so many of our AEC colleagues are totally and blissfully still mesmerized. It pays to examine, even at closer range, why we failed to realize and to speak out concerning that which should have been obvious to us as early as 1963. Indeed, even before we organized the Lawrence Laboratory Biomedical Program, we realized Pauling and others had never been proven wrong concerning the hazard of radiation to man. We said in 1964 we could not defend the radiation standards set by the Federal Radiation Council. But we didn't fight them or the atomic energy programs developing under their blanket of protection. It is obviously erroneous public health practice to go ahead when safety is not assured. And safety is not assured when either of the two situations exist. One. When a hazard is known to be large under the operating conditions for the technology, and two, when the hazard is unknown or not fully understood. New subtitle. Technology promoters ignore even the known hazards. It is bad enough to proceed recklessly with a technology in the face of a serious known hazard. It is an incomparably worse to proceed when there are possibly many fold larger unknown hazards. It is a monumental example of human arrogance that technology promoters and even those ostensibly charged with public health protection make pious pronouncements that the hazards are quote acceptable unquote when they themselves realize the hazards are not even known crudely. Thus, in the case of atomic radiation, the hazard of development of cancer and leukemia is by now reasonably accurately known. 
The genetic hazard is not well known, but the best estimates indicate it is likely to be 5 to 50 times as large an effect, even potentially irreversible disaster for the human species even potentially an irreversible disaster for the human species. So the uncertain hazard or the unknown hazard should lead to considerably more caution than the serious known ones. Does it in practice lead to such caution? Absolutely not. Once we became sufficiently awake to realize the frightening possibilities of the unknown hazards, we pointed this out over and over again to various of our atomic energy colleagues in the Washington office of AEC Biology and Medicine. When we asked the crucial questions mildly, we got benign smiles, a pat on the head, and the vacuous statement that there was a great deal of research to be done on such important unresolved problems. But when we pressed the matter further and asked, why in the world are we proceeding with developments, with developments industrially throughout the land, potentially preparing to expose the whole public to such unknown hazards? The reaction was more grim and unfriendly. Hell, we were told, it will take 20 years to prove or disprove the problems you're bringing up. Atomic energy can't wait that long. Do you want to simply stop progress? The meaning of that as an answer was not lost upon us. Instead of realizing that our ignorance indeed demanded that atomic energy go slow, the atomic energy promoters, including the quote, un the quote, public health protectors, unquote, among them, said full speed ahead, visualizing themselves as modern champions of the pioneer spirit. <clears throat> but, it is, but it is important to realize that few human beings consciously can suffer themselves to commit evil deeds. Atomic energy promoters do not consider their actions evil or their intentions evil, nor do we consider their intentions evil either. The only point is we understand their actions are the result of layer upon layer of soothing rationalizations and we understand only too well the futility of working through all such layered rationalizations to expose the, to expose the confrontation of such men themselves cannot face. Well, I disagree. I think Dr. Teller was really seriously evil. I think he was really, all in all, I think he knew exactly what he was doing. And because they knew it would take 20 years, he thought he'll be dead. Because he is evil. <clears throat> or was. <clears throat> well, we're at 13 minutes. Um, we're on page 92, the mythology of rationalization. I think I'll stop here. I think these are better when they're shorter. So I'll uh, talk to you guys later, and um, thanks for following this book, and uh, ciao, you guys. Put your courage feet on.